Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Artist Series. We are enjoying ourselves by utilizing this new technology. It is very, very exciting. I want to thank you so much for joining us. But I want to welcome today this incredible saxophonist that, that I'm so amazed and impressed with all that you have done and what you are doing. Would you please, everybody, welcome Eric Marienthal. Hey, Dom. Hey, everyone. Thank you very much. Eric, I got to ask you, man, when I look at the different things that you have done and are doing, aside from all the countries you visited, 75 different countries, you've got 15 solo albums, you've got eight Grammy nominations, you've won two Grammys. I mean, you really have had this incredibly active career and you are still in the thick of it <laughs> in the course of what you're doing. Uh, fortunately so. One of the great things about being a musician is just being able to do different, all different kinds of things um, that interest you. I talk to uh, you know, people about that all the time as, as far as like building a career. You know, what do you do? You know, you can do all kinds of different things, but you have to be, you know, you have to feel it. You have to have it. Everything that you do, whether it's writing or teaching or recording or traveling, um, you know, has to be something that you believe in, that you, that you love, or else you're, it's just not going to work. Well, it's, it's, it's extremely obvious through, the, through what you've done and, 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 and just the, how you play is just so great that your passion is you wear it, you know, as a badge of honor, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But you play all different genres of playing. So I want to kind of go back to the beginning. What got you involved in music and, and how did sax enter your life? Let's see. Um, back when I was nine years old, I should ask you the same question. When did you first, when did you first start playing? Well, I actually first started playing at 11. 11, okay. I got you beat. I got yeah, you beat, exactly man. Right. <laughs> so it was fourth grade, and you know, my best buddy uh, and I were you know, minding our own business. And I think the uh, district music teacher came to our classroom and said, hey, if you want to join band, uh, you know, come and see our presentation. And we went, and, and we saw the different instruments laid out, you know, the violins and uh, the clarinets and the flutes and trumpets and and uh, there was an alto saxophone there. And we both looked at each other and said, oh, that one looks cool, you know. And nine years old, what do we know about <laughs> what a saxophone sounds like, you know, that much. So we went to the store and rented our horns and, and off we went. So it, for me, it was really just, you know, it was a social thing. My buddy Steve and I played, but, uh, you know, several of us were in Band. It was just a cool thing to do. In hindsight, wish I had started on the clarinet, frankly, because I, you know, once you start getting more serious into playing saxophone, especially studio work, you have to, um, you have to double. You have to play other wood, woodwinds too. And the clarinet is a much more difficult instrument to play than a saxophone. So, uh, had I started on clarinet, making the transition back to saxophone would have been, you know, a, a step in the easier direction rather than the other way around. <laughs> Boy, it's so interesting. You know, it's amazing how the school music programs were so helpful to us when we were younger. How important was that program for you getting involved with music now and playing with the orchestra or concert band or maybe even the jazz band? Yeah, all three. I can tell you right now, I wouldn't be playing music now. I mean, I certainly wouldn't be playing like I am now or a woodwind instrument. A lot of people, if you're a drummer, if you're a guitar player, you're a bass player, a lot of times, you know, those instruments aren't necessarily, you know, available in the school band. So what do you do? Like my son, you know, he got turned on to the guitar and had nothing to do with school, but he took lessons and we got him a guitar and, you know, he played in his room and there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a guitar. I think there was one guitar player maybe in the jazz band, but there wasn't a guitar player in the orchestra or the symphonic band or the marching band, obviously, you know. And so for us horn players, you know, Ever, that's why it's much it's much more natural for um, you know horn players to to read music because every note that most horn and string players uh, bowed string players play um, they played in school playing in band reading reading the charts you know so sometimes the deficiency actually is uh, developing our ears you know because we we are so reliant growing up on on the paper and we don't you know think about music you know just from a intuitive uh, standpoint. So, um, but yeah, to answer your question, schools, uh, both elementary, junior high school, high school and college, you know, we're, we're very instrumental. No pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> so what happened now with private lessons? Did, did that kind of work its way into you finding someone that started to guide you specifically on your instrument? 
Yes, you know, I, I could have taken better advantage of that when I was younger. Actually, when I was quite young, uh, I, I think a year after we started, there was a Don Hawkins. He's uh, still in this area today, you know, all those years ago, uh, was my teacher for at least a year. And um, uh, so he, you know, has been been a great friend all these years. And uh, And it wasn't actually until... After that, that I was uh, like mid later years in high school that I studied with Warren Marsh. Um, Warren uh, was from like the Lenny Tristano, Tristano School uh, in New York, uh, School of Playing, I should say, and was a very heady uh, jazz musician. I've got to say, whose advice and you know teachings uh, about seventy five percent of which went over my head. You know, <laughs> I wish I could study with him now. You know, but the 25% that landed was really, you know, incredibly valuable to me. Um, and then when I went to Berkeley, the Berkeley College of Music, um, there was a teacher there named Jill Viola. And, you know, um, and he changed my life in terms of playing. You know, he was the guy, ironically, Berkeley, you know, is more of a pop and jazz school. Uh, yet he was the top saxophone teacher at school and he was primarily a classical player so he really taught his students how to correctly play the instrument mm -hmm. and really instilled on you that in you that it's important of course to learn about styles and, and ways to phrase and feel music but if you can command work towards commanding your instrument then it's like changing conversations you know you can play you know you have you, you have a better chance at playing whatever style interests you so what? So how how did you get from learning and practicing to the school? How did you get into Berkeley? How, how did that transition happen? Well, Berkeley, you know, this was I graduated high school in 1976. Prior to that, you know, I was I was on my own, man. I, I my family kind of uh, split apart when I was quite young. I had my own apartment, making my own money, my own job, the whole bit when I was a senior in high school. So uh, when you know a bit earlier, actually, you know, the idea of college, there wasn't anybody saying, oh, you got to go to school, you got to go to school, you know. And uh, so I kind of floated around a little bit, and I had a friend who had graduated from my high school a year before, and, before I did, and uh, he went to Berkeley. And I, uh, we talked, and you know, he said, what are you doing? I said, nothing. <laughs> and uh, he said, man, you know, if you, can, if you can figure out how to do it, you should come here, it's great, the players are great, teachers are great, Boston's great, you know, you'd love it, you'd love it. So I, I applied and, and uh, got in, got, got enough scholarship money to make it, you know, possible. And, uh, and I went. And it was the first time I had been, I'm from California, and it was the first time I had been farther east than Las Vegas, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> it was quite the culture shock, but, uh, but I absolutely fell in love with it. Loved it, loved it. So you got a chance to experience the intensity of the East Coast, as I am from New York, and the Boston area is much like that, the intensity. But there was a lot of music at that time played around when Berkeley was at that heyday. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Michael's Pub, Pooh's Pub, uh, Lulu White's, um, Paul's Mall, uh, the Jazz Workshop. Um, you know, there were, and plus the music that was going on uh, in the Berkeley Performance Center, too. That was, a, that was one of the hipper theaters in town, frankly. And then, of course, all the music that was actually going on at school. Um, people ask me now, you know, what is your favorite takeaway from having gone to school? And I've, you know, I've got to say that, you know, the playing that I got to do with my fellow students every night, you know, if you weren't rehearsing for some, you know, some concert or some school, you know, band pro uh, project or something, we were just jamming. I mean, and I mean like every night. And then we'd go out and do our little, you know, nothing gigs, you know, we'd play in laundry mats, we'd play anywhere we could, you know. But, uh, but it wasn't even that necessary because it was just so much going on at school. It was, it was really great. It's pretty amazing when you think about just the, the memories of what you took from them to what you're applying now. What would be your, your biggest musical takeaway that you took from Berkeley that you still use today? A lot of things, really. I mean, you know, I was in the recording band, uh, the big band that um, Herb Pomeroy led. And that was like the premier band. That was the, um, uh, and he was really the premier teacher, ask, you know, ask anybody, they'll tell you, you know, there were some great, there were some great, great faculty members at school for sure. So not to slide anybody else, but I, I have to say that if, if you would ask anybody, you know, Herb, Herb was the soul of Berkeley, you know, Gary Burton, of course, too, but, um, but interesting for the years that I was at Berkeley, Gary was on sabbatical. So, so he was not even there. 
So the way he led the big band, the way he would write for the band, the way he taught, he has writing classes, the line writing class and the Duke Ellington writing class <clears throat> were the, you know, were the premier arranging classes. And so every, the band met on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And every Tuesday, we would rehearse the top charts that uh, his students had written. And every Thursday, we'd go into the studio and record them. So mm -hmm. once a week, we had a full two-hour recording session. It was amazing. It was fantastic. That, that alone was worth the price of admission. So you come out of Berkeley now, you leave with their groups of musicians you were hanging out with. How did it lead you to, to your career to start taking off and moving forward? And did you go back to LA afterwards? I did. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, I, I didn't really have a, you know, I wasn't really going back home anywhere necessarily, but I'm from LA, you know, so, cause I thought, you know, well, what would it be like to go to New York? You know, and, I mean, you know, 20 years old, 19 years old, give it a try, I suppose. And, and I thought, oh, you know, sure gets cold in New York, you know, I don't know about that. But, uh, but all kidding aside, I mean, I had a lot of, you know, friends and, uh, you know, music uh, associates at, at that time here in LA. And, you know, the business is, is very much a word of mouth business, you know. And so, and I knew that back then. And, and so I just figured, you know, if I'm going to, I may as well not start entirely from scratch, like show up in a city where I don't know a soul, which would have been the case if I'd gone anywhere except uh, come back here. And by the time I left school, I was so into practicing, you know, because of Jill. Uh, I was practicing four hours uh, every night at school when I left. But when I came back here, I, I rented a, uh, a little room in a boarding house, actually. And I got a, a, a job um, busing tables in a restaurant. And when I wasn't working, I was practicing. I probably practiced, you know, seven, eight, nine. I just always practiced, you know. I had this like solid routine that would literally take like, uh, you know, that long just to get through it. And then I'd start working on tunes and then I'd start working on improvising and then I'd start working on some arranging and then I'd start working on some piano and, you know, and just, you know, I was really consumed by it. You know, one thing sort of leads to another, you know, where somebody says, hey, yeah, I, I, I've got this band where you come and play, you know, okay. And oh, hey, we got to, we're going to, we're going to play this, you know, ice cream social, or we're going to play a wedding, or we're going to play whatever. Okay, you know, oh, if we're going to, you know, and then somebody hears you there and goes, oh, I've got a band and we're going to record this song. Oh, okay. And, you know, and like I tell people now, it's like, you know, especially now where anytime you play, the, the potential for you to be seen by anybody in the world who wants to see you who's got, you know, one of these, you know, or one of these, you know, just always make sure to sound your very, very best because you just never know. You know, I'll tell you the Chick Corea story, you know, um, coming up, but, uh, you know, you just never know who's going to listen to you. And, you know, so you've got to make sure that every time you put that instrument uh, in your hands that you're, you're doing it right. So it sounds like you really have to make sure that the standard of what you want to be known as which has to be very high, has got to be consistent all the time because you just don't know who's going to be hearing you or who's going to recommend you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, I, you know, perfect example is here in Los Angeles on the studio scene. You know, before I started playing with Chick and then, you know, created a, um, you know, solo career, uh, I was headed into the studios. I was going to be a studio musician. I wanted to do TV, film, I was doubling and reading, and, and um, that was it. I still do, you know, now, this year, we're doing it all at home, but you could argue that the studio scene is very much about, or 99% or of it is how accurate you play, how in tune you play, how well you blend, how well you read, and how uh, consistent your playing is. And it's a, it's a very different kind of discipline than, than like the, you know, solo record making kind of side of, of the business. Um, very challenging, very exciting um, when it's not giving you a heart attack. But uh, when you're sitting there playing a, you know, a solo on a film and there's a 50 piece orchestra around you and you're the soloist and, you know, the red lights on, you know, go. It's, you know, it's different than being here, you know, in your comfortable little studio. <laughs> Well, listen, the intensity and the stress is still in your little studio because, you know, <laughs> you, you've got to produce what you've got to produce in, in the process of what it is. Yeah, like. that's true. The difference is that I can go back. Well, listen, you've done between hundreds of records and films and television shows and commercial jingles. You really kind of got involved in the session scene, you know, pretty actively at, at certain points, right? It's a big part of uh, what I do. Fortunately, I, I built this room, all my 
studio stuff is on that side of the of the camera. You know, a lot of records are still done, you know, at um, in home studios. Um, anything really that doesn't require you being live with other musicians, you can do just as easily. Well, in my case, much easier um, if it's just you, if you're just a soloist overdubbing on, on something or, or writing or, or whatever. So it's fantastic, actually, you know. So would you say your professional career, and, and I, I, I used to love Al Hurst. I mean, he was he's <laughs> such a, an incredible entertainer and player, what he did. Was, was Al a, a bigger part of your life at a certain point? Well, it was just that one year. When I came back from school and I was practicing my head off and just, you know, I, yeah, I had a busboy job in a restaurant. I was practicing. I was playing here and there and just kind of like, okay, well, so something's going to happen, I guess, eventually, you know, what, what, what happens now, you know. A friend of mine called and said, hey, uh, Al Hurt. Uh, the, the Dixieland trumpet player from New Orleans is going to um, put a big band together and he's auditioning at Dick Grove uh, School of Music in uh, North Hollywood and you should go to the audition. And so I went and I auditioned on tenor and clarinet and I got the gig and at the time uh, it paid $550 a week uh, which was really good. That was yeah. about 100 bucks more a week than Buddy Rich's band was paying, about 150 bucks more than Woody Herman's band was paying, and it was a lot more than Maynard Ferguson's band was paying. Uh, they offered me the gig, and I said, well, can I, you know, can you make a 600? You know, I mean, I can't believe they didn't say, you know, get out of here, kid, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> they, said, they said, okay, you know, I said, man. So I didn't tell anybody else in the band for about six months that I was actually making 50 bucks more a month than they were, <laughs> a week of it. And so we all, we moved to New Orleans. And we played at his club. Uh, it was right on the corner of St. Louis and Bourbon Streets, right in the middle of the French Quarter. At first, uh, before we knew that the band was going to hang in there, we were all in our little you know, hotel rooms. We all ended up uh, getting apartments and staying for a whole year. Yet we played at his club during the week, and then every weekend, just about, we would fly to some, some other gig. You know, we'd fly to you know, Denver or Chicago or, you know, Kansas City or whatever. And, you know, for us, it was like, you know, especially for the younger guys in the band, it's the first time in any of those places, you know, so yeah. it was very fun. Well, what an amazing time. So you got to figure, aside from developing your craft and your skill at the highest level, there's got to be some business knowledge that we use to move forward. So it seems like you were kind of already negotiating more money and you were kind of organizing yourself to keep your business somewhat successful to monetize your craft. <laughs> yeah, well, just because I asked for more money, I think I was just, you know, I'll put it nicely, I was, uh, maybe I was a bit more brazen uh, than <laughs> I should have been, you know. But you're right. I mean, I think successful musicians understand mm -hmm. that the music business is no different than any other business. It's your, it's your product. You know, your music is, your, is what you're selling essentially if you're talking about business and so you know how do we conduct ourselves business-wise you know uh, number one you know if you've got a gig you know show up on time you know be early uh, you know all the usuals be prepared know your music um, you know have the gear that you need to have be wearing what you're supposed to be wearing uh, don't show up late to the airport uh, you know don't miss your flight don't you know you got to make the gig no matter what and and then also you know we can't use what we do for a business to, as an excuse to not do the same things that everybody else does as far as money is concerned. It's an interesting business that, like, sessions are sort of, um, not sort of, they're, they're set, unless you're a soloist, it's really, you know, what you're getting paid is set by the union scale. For a musician, a lot of times you'll take the gig and you get all the details and the last thing you hear about is what it pays. You know, I think a lot of times we're, we're so excited about having a gig that, you know, okay, whatever, I don't care what it pays. Just, yeah, give me the gig, give me the gig, you know. There's nothing wrong with like asking what something pays and making sure that it's worth it to you. You know, you don't want to go do a gig for less money than it's going to cost you to do it. But the other side of that is that, you know, we love it so much. That's why we're musicians. And so just like any other art or, you know, creative thing that's, that's you, you know, we're just, you know, we're, we want to do it. So it's, but it is important if you're trying to make a living at it to have that together too. But it sounds like you, you've got many different hats that you wear. I mean, as a, as a performer, as a uh, solo artist doing your CDs, you know, session player, jingles, whatever that is. But then also in the educational field, You've got, you know, books out and DVDs. You've got, you know, educational, you know, products that you're working on. So you've got a, a balance of several things which are going on at the same time. 
How do you balance all that? Are you, are you an organized person? Uh, I have learned to be. I'm a lot more organized than I ever thought I would be. Uh, when I woke up this morning, I had 20 uh, sessions in the queue that I need to get done. And I got one of them was for uh, this Chikoria project that we're doing. And I um, just finished that a half hour before we get started. We were talking about Dave Weckel earlier. And, okay. uh, you know, he's, he's uh, involved in the... Um, uh, in the mixing process, so I, I send in my tracks. And so th there's, there's the process of organizing that side. Uh, we were talking also on the, um, you know, music director for uh, three jazz cruises that yeah. we do. So that's a whole other side of things. I, I run my school, my artist works um, school. So I, and I have about 650 students virtually there. I have my new record now with Randy Brecker. And so we're, we're uh, organizing a lot of interviews and that kind of thing, virtual concerts and things like that. So yeah, you know, just got to keep, keep it somewhat organized for sure. Well, there's a lot going on. So you've got, you've got different, uh, I use the term files of areas that you're working on as I do too. This is how we survive now in, in these multiple income streams that we have. You perform, you enjoy writing, but you enjoy teaching. So there's a balance that we have to find in all of that. I really do. And, and the school, you know, I teach uh, for Artist Works. It's an online school where, you know, people subscribe and all the lessons are there on film. And um, I have probably 200 and some odd lessons there uh, ranging uh, across all different uh, levels. And there's a lot of different, um, you know, tracks that people play along with and PDFs that people download and all kinds of different things. And then they, uh, they video themselves um, working on a lesson or whatever they want to work on, whatever they're working on. And then they post it in the site. I see it and I film a response and, and um, send it to them. And the whole community of, of my school can see both sides. They, they can view the student um, submissions and my responses. And it's fun. Uh, Peter Erskine is a drum teacher at that school. Uh, John Petitucci and Nathan East are the bass uh, teachers. George Witte has a jazz piano school. There's about 30 schools altogether. It's great. I, I actually prefer it over like a live Skype kind of situation, Zoom kind of situation, because, um, you know, players can, you know, really work on what they're doing and, and film themselves and do it several times if they want to and get it to where they want to do. And then I can watch, rather than being live and kind of you know, as we're talking, trying to come up with ideas for, you know, students, things to work on. I can, I can like look at what they're doing and think about it for a bit and then film myself with a real, you know, thought of thought through idea for what they can go and where they can go next. But with that many students that are involved, how much time does this take out of your day to organize that? Right. Yeah, I know. It sounds rather daunting. There's, there's one, I think Paul Gilbert, the, the shred guitar teacher has like 3000 more, maybe, you know, um, not every student submits anything you know they they subscribe to the school and then they they just take whatever they want to take there's a there's you know you don't have to do the videos uh, it's only a an option but you can do perfectly well just you know watching the videos and things so yeah no i'm not doing 650 a week <laughs> and how about your instructional books you've got three instructional books out right i do yeah comprehensive jazz studies and exercises the ultimate jazz play along yeah. and the music of eric marienthal right the, the latter is a transcription a book of uh, solos that were transcribed of mine. Uh, but the Comprehensive Jazz Studies and Exercises book is a, a big book uh, that it's basically, it's a jazz book, sort of, but it's mostly like a technique book. And there's a lot of harmony involved too. Um, but it's about 200 plus pages. And I laugh because I wrote most of it when the electric, when the Chicory Electric Band was really traveling a ton. I don't think I wrote a note of it at home. I think it was all written, you know, on the bus or on a plane or in my hotel room or in, in some dressing room behind the theater somewhere or, or whatever. And it was really fantastic because, you know, I would like pick Chick's brain and, and everybody, Frank, Dave, John, I, I, you know, say, hey, so what do you think about the diminished scale? How would you, you know, what, what different permutations would you, and John would say, oh man, try this, try this, really? <laughs> tell me more, tell me more. You know, I knew Michael Brecker really, really well, and I talked to him a lot about various ideas, and Eddie Daniels, you know, the genius clarinet player. Got a lot of ideas from him, for which I, I have credited him many times, you know. And, and uh, so, yeah, doing that kind of project uh, kind of solidifies idea that, ideas that you have, but it also, you know, leads you into, into directions playing-wise and technique-wise and, um, you know, pedagogy-wise that you wouldn't have thought of on your own necessarily.
Well, you've tapped into some brilliant, brilliant minds. Eddie Daniels, who I'm a huge fan, I used to go hear him with the Thad Jones Mel Lewis band at the yeah. Village Vanguard in New York, and just phenomenal player of himself. So you were able to kind of pull from these resources around you, yeah, and and really put together ideas that have put together three successful books together. That so now the the writing of the book and the putting it all together. I mean, that's another another skill that you have to have now in organizational skills to make that happen. Right, you know, you and I both grew up in like the the world of books and and having like you know actual rather than virtual learning tools, and so it was really cool to like see different people, see different people who had written, you know, I mean the education and the learning doesn't change or the or the material doesn't change whether it's whichever way you're you know you're getting your medium. It was always inspiring to um, to corner somebody. You know the Eddie Daniels thing. We were on the road with the uh, GRP big band in Japan, and um, we were sitting next to each other on a plane, and we we were flying into a uh, into an airport that it was a storm going on, and so we were trying to learn, land in uh, Fukuoka, and then the pilot had to bring the plane back up and go around again, and we were gonna try to land, and this happened like three times and every time it took about 45 minutes to get the whole back approach. So on this little, you know, most flights in Japan, it's not that big of a country, so you're not in the air for very long. We were in the air for nearly four hours and Eddie couldn't care less about the weather or anything. We we're talking about music and playing and technique and exercises and stuff. And uh, yeah, he, he told me his routine, you know, where typically, you know, he would like get up in the morning, have a triple espresso, go down to his basement and just play and play and play and play and play. And <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know about Eddie Daniels, he's just a freak of nature. His clarinet playing is just off the charts, but he's a, in a, just a, a ridiculous flute player. He, he says he doesn't really even play flute anymore. That's completely not true. <laughs> uh, but in his saxophone playing is just, you know, just gorgeous. He loves playing tenor. And in fact, I did something with him um, where I played alto and he played tenor um, about, a, about a year ago, I guess. Uh, yeah, amazing. <laughs> Well, you have had the likes of being around so many great people. I mean, Elton John, Barbara Streisand, Billy Joel, Stevie Wonder, you know, B.B. King, The Yellow Jackets. You really have had some incredible, legendary artists that you've played with. What have you pulled from all of this? If you think back, you know, what, what you know, and you're sitting back and you're, you have some time now during this, this COVID pandemic. Where did your mind go with all this traveling and these memories of what you've been doing? In a lot of places, actually. Uh, it's, it's interesting because... Being on the organizational side of things, like for the cruises, for instance, uh, the love boat comes to mind. You know, it's, it's not that. You know, it's like a floating jazz festival. Um, and and so getting to work with, uh, right now I'm working a lot with Marcus Miller, and getting to watch, he's a great example because he's a busy, busier than, you know, than anybody, it seems like. He's just doing so many different things. Um, but he's always really in the moment. And if he's involved in something that's all, he's got his, you know, he's focused. And that's, it was such a great lesson for me because, you know, one thing, you know, during this pandemic that's taught me or made me realize is that, you know, I'm busy now, uh, thank goodness, you know, but, but I was doing a lot of things that, and traveling at the same time. I was on the road for 208 days last year. I actually went on my calendar and counted, you know, and playing with a lot of different people and doing all the different kinds of things. Now it's, now it's more, you know, focused, I guess. But I was realizing that, you know, I don't want to say that I was phoning it in, you know, on anything, but like, you know, okay, I can do this, okay, I'll practice, okay, I can do the part, okay, you know, you know, that was kind of like the, the way things were going for several years, really. And, um, and working, you know, working with a lot of those kinds of artists, when they do something, they, they really just focus on that. And then, then they move on to the next thing, but then they're focused on that. It doesn't mean that you, you can't multitask for sure, but you don't multitask all at the same time. You know, you're not thinking about one thing while you're trying to do something else, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's a beautiful lesson, you know. And even when in practicing, you know, it, it's hard for us. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, my phone is right here, you know, it's hard to turn the thing off, you know, and to, and the few times that I have like said, I'm going to sit here and practice, you know, and I'm not going to practice until I get an email. I'm not going to say I'm going to practice until I get a text, you know, no, I'm going to practice and I'm going to focus on this and really make it worthwhile. Try doing that. Try turning off your phone for an hour, you know, good luck. I got, you know, it's, but it's valuable.
when we were younger, before we had that, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, sparkly device that would pull our attention away, we had to focus. Uh -huh. And it was a different time years ago. So it's changing right now for young kids. And it really is kind of difficult for them to realize that. I always say, turn it off. Give me all you have at this moment and let's reap the most out of that moment. That's really where that, that in the moment is, where it's 100% attention. Chick is a great example of that, you know, in, 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 in so many aspects. Uh, you know, we could spend this entire hour just talking about what, you know, what I've learned from just playing with Chick, mm -hmm. you know, how to, you know, how to be a band leader, how to, how to just, you know, make your musicians uh, in your band feel like they can do anything. And that the more you go for it, the more you express yourself, the better, you know, just go, 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 do it, do it, do it. Um, and I'm excited next year, we're going to, um, you know, as long as things uh, go in the direction they, they should supposed to go, uh, we're going to be traveling quite a lot. We have a new record, a new live record that's going to be coming out uh, early part of next year. And uh, so we've got a lot of touring uh, that we're, you know, hoping to be able to do. I don't know anybody who can focus in on things more than Chick Corea. You know, I mean, I, you know, and I've had the, the, the amazing good fortune of being in his band since 1986. And, and the fact that he's so excited right now about the electric band is just such, such a thrill. You know, we, we communicate a lot uh, right now. And, and, you know, here's, you know, one of the premier jazz musicians of all time. You know, he's done a lot of things, obviously, um, uh, you, know, you know, in his career. And so and he can do a lot of things all at the same time as well. But, um, but yeah, it really is a, uh, it's a thrill to watch him beat your career, you know, just the <laughs> way the way he operates and, and not to mention, you know, pretty fun to watch play too. <laughs> it really is. And I had the wonderful opportunity of sitting down with him in one of these interviews and, and uh, talking to Chick and he was just, uh, you know, so open about his life and, and all that he's doing. So th there are these special souls that you seem to have attracted in your life. That really is an amazing story, Eric. It really is that you have had so many incredible opportunities that you have created because of the kind of person you are and the kind of artist that you've leveled yourself to be. You really have brought in some top of the top of the players in all of the different genres. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's, you know, the, as you well know, um, the musician community is, is very tight and it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a brotherhood, you know, and a sisterhood. It's a, it's a, it's a community and, you know, it, it's it's very fun um, to call on someone to collaborate with. Um, it's almost like so often, you know, somebody will 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 um, you know call and say, "Hey, can you play my record?" And I would never think to say, "Well, yeah, you know, send me the track and you know, uh, and I'll I'll." I'll I'll think about it, you know. It's always, oh man, no, I want to make music. And that's the way it is, I think, in, in the community of musicians. I mean, just we love to collaborate. We love to work together um, for the most part. And, and it's just a, you know, it's an emotional thing. Plus, you know, now everybody collectively in the world is going through this emotional time. And uh, to be able to make music together, even if it has to be virtually, um, is still, uh, you know, it's a drug. You know, it's an outlet. It's a it's a re re release. You know, I look back over the people who I've gotten to work with on records and live, and and pinch myself. It's really, um, it's really quite a thing. You know, they, uh, you mentioned the Yellow Jackets at one point. You know, I, I subbed for uh, Bob Minzer quite a lot in that band, and and it was just one of the most. You know, a lot of the bands I get to play with, luckily, are, are really a spiritual experience. But that was like really a, uh, you know, Russell and, and Jimmy and Will. You know, it's just man, making music with that, that bunch of guys is just, you know, I mean, you just you feel like you just went to church, you know, it just feels... <laughs> it uh, really is a high. They're, they're great, great people and great musicians. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that combination is rare, but it, is, it seems like you seem to attract yourself to those kinds of people. How do you organize all this? How do you, with all that you're doing, with the cruises and the books and the, the artistworks.com, the recordings... Now the electric band, here you are sending files to Weckl. And how do you, you know, when you wake up in the morning, how the hell do you put this all together? That's a, it's a very pertinent question for me right now. Because, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm lucky. I, I am doing a lot of different uh, things. The answer to your question is I write things down. 
and I say on this day, th this is my um, goal, you know, because on top of everything else, you know, we have our little, uh, a little granddaughter, uh, my, my, uh, my daughter, whose birthday it happens to be today, as a matter of fact, we uh, um, uh, were, they were over here this morning uh, for uh, early breakfast and, and, um, and they live right down the street, you know, so we babysit our little granddaughter, you know, two or three times a week and we, we go visit, uh, they come visit, you know, the, we live two miles away, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's like, how do I stay on track? And then suddenly my little granddaughter shows up, you know, it's like, oh, forget all that stuff. I'm going to play with my granddaughter, you know, <laughs> which has happened many, 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 many times. <laughs> um, you know, so it's just a matter of, of, of keeping everything, um, all the balls in the air, you know, and, and just, you know, not being overwhelmed because then if you get, if you start getting overwhelmed and you don't, uh, you know, have a, have your, you know, daily sort of idea for what you want to get done. Even if it's not a, mat a matter of work, you know, it's just, you want to, I don't know, get your horn fixed or you want to practice a certain thing, you want to whatever. If you wake up in the morning and have all these things, you know, just on your brain, you're not going to do any single one of them well. You know, if you're trying to teach a lesson to somebody and you're thinking about 10 other things, you're not going to teach a very good lesson. You know, if you're if you're recording something um, and you're thinking about the other things you've got to do, um, you know, it's, it's just, you know, and I learned that, you know, while the guys in the electric band are, are great at that. Weckl's unbelievable. You know, he's super organized. Talk about a guy who's focused. You yeah. know, Dave Weckl's incredibly disciplined, incredibly so. Um, and his playing shows that, you know, you can just tell by the way he approaches his, his, his drum set, um, that he's just a very organized thinker, um, and a very, very focused thinker. Um, he's a guy, I mean, everybody in that group where, you know, we've all talk about a family, you know, we've all, you know, we, we started in 1980. I, I was, I'm the most recent member, uh, you know, Frank joined a month before I did and the, and the band started, you know, as a trio before that. And you know that was 1986. You know, so we've been around for a while, yeah. um, and it, you know everybody thinks very similarly. That's why the band gets along so well. We just have so much fun together. But it's really interesting. I've learned a lot just seeing how how Dave operates. You know, and just really just won't settle for anything unless it's really great. You know, yeah. playing the music, the hotel, uh, <laughs> you know, sound, everything. Yeah. Uh, so oh, Dave is, is is extremely organized. I've done many clinics with him and, and traveled with him, and he is just so professional and just so you know. Uh, talk about being in the moment, whether it's during a sound check, whether it's during his setup, whether it's during the actual performance, or speaking to somebody afterwards. You know, those are skills that that you know you carry also. I mean, that's I think that's the level that has to be delivered now in this twenty first century of of how we live life. Mm -hmm. Those are really, really important skills to have. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I mean, don't settle for things that aren't right, you know, just because you're a musician and you're happy to be doing something like a, a gig or whatever it is, you know, it's like, hey, well, at least we get to play. Okay, well, the sound isn't very good, but at least we get to play. Well, it didn't really pay much money, but at least we get to play. Getting to play is, is great, but, but you don't, never want to, feel like you're being taken advantage of uh just be hey hey kid you know i gave you a gig so you know deal with it you know okay that you don't have a hot meal but you got a gig okay you, you know you're not going to get this but you got a gig you know you know we put you in a hotel with five other people but you got a gig you know, <laughs> um, you know i mean it, it's yeah learned that from dave too <laughs> It's, that's great, great advice for any future generation to understand and listen to for sure. Let me ask you this last question. What motivates you? That is a multi-parted question. I won't take 10 minutes to answer it or anything, but, but it depends on where you're at. You know, I mean, we all have to survive and whatever you do for a living is how you make your money. The business side of it is motivation, certainly. But on the artistic side, you know, knowing what that feeling feels like when you sit down at your instrument or you pick it up and um and it feels really good one of the things i talk about with chick all the time people ask me well, you know what is it like to play with chick you know what, what, what is, what's this thing you know one of the things about chick that just amazes me is that he seems as though he can play whatever he thinks of whatever comes to mind he can he can do it he can execute it um and so how do you get to that point you know how you know that when we go on on tour and you you're doing you know 
you know, one night is night after night after night, you know, day after day, week after week, a few times month after month. You know, your chops get to a point where you're feeling pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I used to come home from those tours feeling like Superman. It's like, you know, yeah, you know, this is rocking. And so when you get to that, to a certain point, you know, wh wherever that point is for you, and, um, and then you start slipping from that. It's like, oh, no. No, it doesn't feel as good as it did. I, I, I got to get back there. So you get in that practice room, you turn on that metronome, and you go. And and you know, so to answer your question, um, you know, what motivates me is to try to play my very best because I, I, you know, when I'm when I'm playing my personal best, it's indescribable because it's a way to, you know, it's another way that we can express ourselves. It's like being a great orator or a great writer or a great, you know, you can really like, you know, get what's here out and on a musical side if, if you know that feeling of like having less of a barrier between you and your soul and your instrument you know if you can you know if you can knock down as much of that barrier as possible that it really feels good so that you know playing wise that's you know that is the motivation to try to play your best boy the fact that you are inspired when you are playing at your best just just totally completes the circle, Eric, because when you play, you inspire others so greatly. Your playing is so deep. It is so honest. It is, it, it, I, I sense humility in your playing. There's so many great qualities of great integrity that that really is powerful that you have gotten to that stage in your life. And you continue to do this at an extremely high level. <laughs> For that, we thank you so much. On behalf of the Sessions panel, at a distance, Eric, thank you so much. You have got so much to offer. This time that we've had has been absolutely wonderful. Safe travels, stay well, and thank you so much. Hey, my pleasure, Tom. Thank you very, very much for having me. Tom Famular here, the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.